Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Jeff Hergen. Rather, I'm a physician in California. I have uh, a private practice in California doing cannabis consulting for the last 20 years. Uh, this has uh, been a really enjoyable change from family or from general practice and from ER medicine to go into cannabis medicine. I take this practice very seriously. I've I'm kind of an old-styled physician. I, I request patient records before I see patients. I usually uh, set up an appointment for about 90 minutes for my initial adult uh, uh, consultation, two hours for children. So in California, we can see anybody from, you know, of any age group with any condition. So I want to know if it's in the record, the problem that they're coming to me about, and, and then basically tailor a treatment plan to work with them. Uh, I am president of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. This is a group that started in about 2000, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. So we all choose our evidence as it meets our needs, and there are ancient sources of information that are very interesting. There are burial and tombs uh, that are, you know, where cannabis has been used in the past. We have evidence from William O'Shaughnessy back in the middle of the 19th century, uh, he, he was spoken of yesterday, going from England to, uh, to Calcutta back in 1833 and working there for over a decade, learning about cannabis and writing about it and eventually bringing it back to uh, England as a medicine in uh, 1844. Uh, some cling to the reefer madness uh, level of information and you know that's just something we have to deal with. Dr. Macaria, the founder of this Society of Cannabis Clinicians, uh, wrote a book uh, that wasn't published at NIMH. He was there as a, uh, as a uh, doctor studying cannabis in the 1960s and 70s. And when he was asked to go to California and, and spy on the college students smoking cannabis, he realized they really weren't that interested in the medicinal uses of cannabis. But his book was about the English language literature on medical marijuana from uh, 1839 until 1972. Of course, we have the LaGuardia reports in 44 and the Schaefer Commission in 72. Both these uh, documents exonerated cannabis as being a problem. They basically said that cannabis users are indistinguishable in our society from those that don't use cannabis. And then we have the IND program that the government was really forced to get involved, when, got involved with because patients who weren't getting adequate treatment with conventional medicines uh, basically sued the federal government and the federal government was then forced to allow them to use cannabis as medicine. Uh, then uh, they, about a year later, they forced the government to actually supply them with the cannabis. So there's are still a half dozen or so patients using cannabis from the federal government. There were at least 19 that were using cannabis over the years. And then George Bush Sr. came along and in 1992 closed the program saying there was no scientific value to marijuana. Well, it's interesting to note that the feds never looked at any of these patients or their experiences or what it was doing for them. Uh, that's just the way it is. The federal agenda was to keep cannabis down. So the feds parental perennially refuse to reschedule cannabis and they continue to put out misinformation to the public and to the physicians, basically scaring people from the use of cannabis. And even as early as just a, month, uh, a couple months ago in January, we had an update from the National Academies of Sciences talking about need for greater research. Well, this is kind of a problem because we can't get the research that we want, certainly not in terms of cannabis as a medicine. We can get it as cannabis as a drug of abuse. Those uh, research projects are approved and done by NIDA. But as far as a medicine, it just doesn't happen. For the physicians doing cannabis work, we have our clinical evidence. So cannabis, as you probably well know, is one of the most studied therapeutically active substances in history, far exceeding almost all pharmaceuticals. Uh, the PubMed literature and the Google Scholar literature is full of tens of thousands of, of papers on these subjects. Of course, you already know that the cannabinoid receptors are in the animal kingdom, accepting insects from hydra to humans. So it's there as a modulating uh, system to keep our bodies in balance. Uh, 
You've seen this already today. This is the presence of the CB1 receptors in the brain. So the receptors are there, modulating the way the nervous system works, and in the peripheral nerve endings throughout the body, as well as in the uh, immune system, also modulating the immune system in the tonsils and the adenoids and the liver and the spleen and the T cells and the B cells. So it's not that the federal government doesn't understand this. Modulating endocannabinoid activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans, including this laundry list of conditions. This came out of NIH four years ago. It, so they understand this. It's just that they're not thinking of cannabis as the way to get there. They're looking to protect the interests of the pharmaceutical industries to bring us new generations of medicines. This is just an incomplete but longer list of the pharmacologic effects of cannabinoids that we uh, saw in part yesterday. And you can scan through them to see the kinds of things that cannabinoid activation is known to do in the body. But what do we hear from the government? The health assertions uh, of harm in the pulmonary tract, possible uh, smoking cannabis causing lung cancers, brain injuries, addiction, psychosis, schizophrenia, and impairment, uh, short-term memory loss and driving, as well as fetal and neonatal harm are all asserted. And we continue to get really bathed in this misinformation that comes from the government. Let's start and pick apart a little bit of this. Donald Tashkin is Professor Emeritus of Pulmonary Medicine at UCLA, and he's worked for NIDA for 45 years in an effort to find harm in smoking cannabis. Well, he does show that smoking cannabis causes irritation of the airway, some inflammation, some edema, and some increase in mucus production. But there is no evidence of clinically significant alterations in pulmonary function studies. This means no COPD, no emphysema, even in the heavy cannabis users. And going on to do a large epidemiologic study, he showed that there is no substantive evidence of any increase in the incidence of cancers of the lung, trachea, larynx, pharynx, or esophagus, even in the heavy cannabis smokers. If you pick at his data a bit, you'll see that those that are smoking cannabis and smoking tobacco had a 37% decrease in the incidence of developing any of these cancers. What about marijuana studies at Kaiser? Stephen Sidney is a doc uh, epidemiol uh, epidemiologist in Kaiser's Oakland uh, division, and he looked at nearly 65,000 patients and divided them into cohorts of non-smokers, marijuana smokers, and tobacco smokers. And just looking at the cancers of the lung, the tobacco smokers went on to develop 46 cancers over a short period of time. The non-smokers had two lung cancers and the marijuana smokers none. So getting these cannabinoids into the lungs when we're irritating the lungs seems to actually be responsible for extinguishing these cells and causing them to not become a problem. Brain injury, we know that short-term memory impairment has been observed after heavy chronic recreational cannabis usage, but it virtually disappears after abstinence. And more recent studies are similarly encouraging with regards to reversibility of any cannabis-associated cognitive sequelae. Hippocampal volume changes are asserted by the government, but the most recent studies there show that there's no significant gray matter changes observed in cannabis users. And then lower grade point averages and IQ and performance differences are asserted in teens using cannabis, but these two uh, are insignificant when controlling for tobacco and alcohol use. The NIDA director often quotes a surmised neurotoxic effect of cannabis on the developing brain that permanently lowers IQ. This study was reviewed at the University of Oxford and finds the conclusions premature in light of likely confounding from socioeconomic status. What about addiction? We've talked about this a bit already, and it's postulated that and there's an often quoted uh, incidence of 9% of ever cannabis users becoming dependent at some point on cannabis. Well, we have to temper this a bit with the facts that this is based in part on substance abuse treatment programs. And so as these people come into these programs, the majority of them don't really have a substance abuse program, a problem. They're there because it's mandated, 
that they either go to jail or to court or take the substance abuse program. So this is more or less a laughable condition for my thousands of patients that I've seen over the years. They don't have any trouble coming and going from cannabis use. They may like cannabis use, and you might say they're habituated to it, but they're not addicted to it. And there's no significant withdrawal, and they can come and go from cannabis use quite easily. What about psychosis and schizophrenia? Well, this is really depending on your viewpoint, your perspective. If you have a child that's gone on to develop schizophrenia, and he or she may have smoked pot as a teen, you may very well feel that this has been responsible for your teen's change. Well, causality is unsupported by the literature. If you look at the Keele University study, this is the largest study that I've seen done. It came out of England. It studied cannabis use in the clinic system in the UK for 10 years, from 1996 through 2005. And over that period of time, 2.3% of the English population came through the clinic system. And of those, during that time, there was an increase in cannabis use in the general population by four-fold. Uh, and in the 18 and younger population, they had an 18-fold increase in the use of cannabis. And when they looked at the population and the incidence of uh, psychosis and schizophrenia, they found that the incidence and prevalence of schizophrenia and psychosis were either stable or declining during this decade when cannabis use was increased so much. Fetal and neonatal harm, again, assertions of harm, and doctors are quite afraid of its use in, in, in nursing mother mothers and in pregnant women. But the evidence isn't there either. Maternal marijuana use during pregnancy is not an independent risk factor for adverse neonatal outcomes after adjusting for confounding factors. And in a study a little ways back, marijuana use was relatively common in pregnant women and was not related to adverse pregnancy outcomes. It was the tobacco, and tobacco is still the most commonly abused drug during pregnancy and responsible for adverse pregnancy outcomes. Probably the most important study is one from Melanie Dreher when she went to Jamaica and studied uh, pot smoking pregnant women. She had 30 women that were heavy pot smokers, and she got 30 others that were their, their uh, group of um, non-smoking women that they compared to. And she followed these people through their pregnancy, their labor, delivery, and, and to, through the first neonatal month of life. And without reading the, the fine print, basically she said that the kids that came out of these pregnant uh, pregnancies from pot smoking moms were actually doing better at the end of the first month of life. They were more alert, they didn't need as much arousing, and they just seemed to be doing well. She got this paper published in Pediatrics in 1994, then went back several years later to see how these kids were doing later on in life. And she found again that they were actually doing better than the, than the control group. She went back to Pediatrics Magazine with her evidence and asked to prep publish her information. They said, no, nope, this is the Earth Mother Syndrome, they explained. It's just that these pot smoking moms were, were better mothers. So what about the future? <laughs> Cannabis is making a difference and is likely to continue to play a role in the world of mainstream medicine with or without the federal government's prohibition. We know that we have to have clean medicines available and that to have any uh, product approved as a pharmaceutical, it must have proof of biochemical uniformity and stability along with safety and efficacy as proven by the randomized clinical or con uh, controlled trials. This is the problem, because the federal government does not want to see these studies, so they're not done, so we don't get the evidence that we're looking for. Basically, you have to have approval by NIDA, DEA, FDA, I think maybe PHS is off the hook now, Public Health Service, but Health and Human Services all have to approve a study before it can be done in the United States as a randomized controlled study of cannabis. So basically, the federal bureaucracies and the influence from the pharmaceutical industry and what I would call the drug war industries effectively prohibit cannabis studies. But the public has changed the world here because word of mouth from person to person 
now has it to where we have changed the laws in many, many of our states. The darker green states are those where we've approved adult use of cannabis. The pale green states are the ones where we have medical marijuana and not even shown are 17 more states where, we've, where states have approved the use of cannabinoids that are not psychotropic, mainly speaking of CBD. So what about the evidence? There's valid you know, randomized controlled studies that we basically can't get, and then we have our clinical observations. The founder of the SCC, Dr. Todd Micaria, years ago said, we have a problem with this gold standard study because we can't, we can't use it. We're not getting the opportunity to study cannabis in controlled uh, studies. Uh, this randomized controlled tr uh, trials were ushered into medicine in the 40s, while the time-honored honored clinical observations have, a, have been assigned to anecdotal and really invalid evidence, which I would argue with. It is valid evidence. The value of the randomized controlled study depends upon the study design and who's funding the study and what they intend to show. And the value of the clinical observation hinges, too, upon the expertise and the reliability of the observer. They both have opportunity for institutional or personal bias. You know, we had Vioxx some years ago, a great anti-inflammatory drug. It went through RCTs, but 55,000 people died of cardiac deaths, even though it had gone through the, the studies of being able to show that it was supposedly safe and effective. So just because it's an RCT doesn't re really show that it's safe. So. The feds continue to refuse medical cannabis research. We, this is an interesting little bit that has come out of the American Academy of Ophthalmology in 1992, basically saying marijuana safety and efficacy, or safety hasn't been demonstrated through the federal regulatory process. I would say that it never will get the federal regulatory process. So what they had said, was that there is no scientifically verifiable evidence that the use of marijuana is safe and effective in the treatment of glaucoma. They had studied it back in the 70s. It does lower intraocular pressure. What they never looked at was the neuroprotective qualities of cannabis that are exceptional and for which the government has uh, patented the use of uh, uh, patented cannabinoids, I should say. And then in 1997, uh, the the, the National Eye Institute in the NIH concluded that none of the studies demonstrate that marijuana or, marijuana or any of its components could safely and effectively lower intraocular pressure, get this, any more than a variety of drugs on the market. So they don't want it to be studied. They don't want the competition. So cannabis is effective for, for glaucoma and I've been watching it for years in my own patients with stability in their glaucoma, but again, this is uh, problematic when it comes to research because we really can't get it. With the embargo on cannabis clinical studies, what the Society of Cannabis Clinicians did was we formed our own journal. O'Shaughnessy was published in 2003. We put out a couple issues a year or, a, or an issue a year since that time and it gave us an opportunity to publish our clinical findings without the requirements of the RCT, the IRB, and the peer review that would be required in order to try to get a controlled study. And so the journal is called O'Shaughnessy's, again named for William O'Shaughnessy, the English physician who went to Calcutta in 1933, stayed there over a decade observing and writing about and studying the use of cannabis, and he was uh, quite influential as he took this inform information back to the uh, English in uh, 1844. Here in 1843, his uh, paper led the paper, uh, his uh, article on Indian hemp or gunja and how to prepare it. So he was preparing cannabis for use as an anticonvulsant and for other medical uses. Well, in O'Shaughnessy's, in our first issue, we also put up Dr. Micaria's cannabis as a substitute for alcohol. And really, throughout our journal, every issue, we have our clinical studies and we have our observations that we show, which are very useful for clinicians and for our patients. As long as we give it to our patients for free, we uh, can get it for a very low price. This is just a case that appears in O'Shaughnessy's. 
Uh, this is a baby that came to me 16 months of age. You'll see a large tumor deep in the brain on the left-hand column. Uh, we, he was advised chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The parents said, I'll get back to you, and they came to me. We started putting the full extract cannabis oil on his pacifier. You see three months later, the column shows the tumor fading, and in the middle column, five months after we started putting the cannabis oil on his pacifier, the tumor had virtually disappeared. This, yes, thank you. This kiddo is now uh, in first grade. He has gone through some IQ testing to just see how he's doing. He measured at 135, so no one's worried about this little guy. And then Crohn's disease. This is a subject that I'll briefly review because I really am running out of time. Uh, my first publication on our pilot study was in 2005 on a dozen patients with Crohn's disease. All of the early docs in the society reported our benefits with using cannabis in Crohn's disease. We went on to study uh, what ISO put out of Italy for years, showing all of these pharmacologic, uh, physiologic effects of cannabinoids in the gut on the CB1 and CB2 sides. And then we, had, uh, we got 38 patients with Crohn's disease to come into the study, and we asked them about with and without cannabis, what's your pain, your appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, stools per day, depression, activity level, flare-up frequency and severity, and what's their weight. And so these columns here, each pair of columns represents each patient's response. Stools per day were down uh, from 5.3 on a mean number of stools per day to 3.7 with smoked cannabis. Pain was markedly down-regulated. Appetite markedly up-regulated. Nausea down-regulated. You see the p-values over on the right side as well. Vomiting markedly down-regulated. Fatigue down-regulated. Depression significantly down-regulated. And the psychiatrists that I've seen show this to say this ought to be published independently. Commonly, drugs don't work this well for depression. Activity level up-regulated. So in spite of what you might think about people smoking pot all day, they get up and go when they're using cannabis for Crohn's disease. Their weights are up about 12%. Their flare-up frequency is markedly down, and their flare-up severity similarly is markedly down. So in conclusion, the clinical observations and findings are valid evidence of the safety and efficacy of cannabis. Where do we go from here? Well, with the industry coming along as it is, I think it's time to buy our legislators like the prohibitionists have been doing for so long. <laughs> <laughs>